This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by Celsius.co.nz Hottopic.co.nz Skepticalscience.com And KiwiFM Welcome along to The Climate Show, episode number four, recording on December the 16th, 2010. My name is Glenn Williams, recording in the Kiwi FM studio, in fact, the broadcasting studio, Auckland City. My co-host, of course, Gareth Renaldin from hot-topic.co.nz, joining us in North Canterbury. Hello to you, Gareth. Good afternoon, Glenn. And of course... Uh, what, a nice, what a nice day it is down here. It's oh, good. rain soon. Not so good up here. Very humid, humid, hot, and, um, and drizzly. But that's that's this time of the year, I suppose. Absolutely, it's at least it's not snowing. No, indeed, indeed, and of course, uh, why we're we talking about the weather? Well, it's easy to do when it's the, called the climate show. It's a show, of course, all about weather and the climate, uh, news, science, a, little, a wee bit of a snapshot, I suppose, of the uh, the latest information on climate, uh, particularly climate change, all around the world. And of course, we have great guests as well. Looking forward to chatting with uh, Peter Glick today, Gareth. Yes, absolutely. He's a, a really interesting guy. He's talking to us from the American Geophysical Union Congress in, in San Francisco, which is the, they call it the Fall Congress, um, and of course fall means autumn in the US, and December, of course, is the first month of winter. So, yep, their um, nomenclature is uh, interesting, but it is the world's biggest um, earth sciences uh, uh, scientific meeting. Fantastic amount of stuff going on there and it'll be really good to find out from Peter, who is himself a really interesting guy, uh, a specialist in uh, matters to do with the uh, hydrological cycle, water resources and so on. Um, he had a, a MacArthur Genius Fellowship Award and his um, is a genius? CV is... You're saying he's a genius? Well, uh, somebody else said he was a genius, so yeah, I think that I, I think I'll be happy to go with that. Crikey! Um, no, he's a, he's a really really interesting character and a very interesting CV to read through. I'll put the I'll put his details up on the um, on the show notes. But uh, yeah, we're, I think we're very lucky to be able to get uh, Peter to join us and give us an on the spot report. Mm. And of course, um, John from Skeptical Science, John Cook, will be back so today. We're looking at climate sensitivity. Sensitivity. I think we're changing. Uh, the feature just just for today yeah we're looking at climate sensitivity it's a, a really interesting subject because um, what we're talking about is how sensitive in other words how much warming you get for a certain um, addition of greenhouse gases and John's got some really good um, explanatory graphics uh, it's also something that skeptics like to harp on about because about the only credible form of skepticism that's left in other words skepticism that has some sort of um, genuine intellectual um, sort of rationale mm. is to argue that climate sensitivity is low and that means that you know you can add lots and lots of carbon, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because it isn't going to cause much warming but what John's going to run us through is the evidence that suggests that what we expect, which is very roughly about three degrees Celsius of warming for a doubling of carbon dioxide over the levels that were around uh, pre-industrial uh, revolution, um, we, all, he's going to run us through all the evidence of for why that's a, a pretty well-founded number. Okay, great. Look forward to that. And then finally, of course, always rounding up the show with um, some positive stuff. Um, not that the rest of the show isn't positive. It's great, really. But um, uh, the solutions looking at some green tech innovation. Yeah, and, and some of it, it, it really is green tech because we're going to look at uh, some of the things that European winemakers are having to do to, to adapt their vineyards to a climate that's changing really very rapidly. Mm. Um, so that'll be interesting. Oh, and a bus. And a bus, great. Like buses, yeah. except when you get hit by them. Um, but <laughs> before before we uh, get on into the news and a wrap-up of the, um, the Cancun 
a climate talk. So I do want to thank um, scoop.co.nz who uh, came on board with the, the last episode, episode number three, and um, and basically highlighted it at the top of the scoop.co.nz um, webpage, which I I, um, I think has brought on a whole lot of uh, more viewers and um, and listeners to the show as well. So welcome to to anyone who's discovered the show through um, scoop.co.nz, and we hope to keep that relationship going into the future as well. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, um, thanks to Al at Scoop and the team there, um, mm. Lyndon and everybody else. Uh, hopefully, we can. Um, we can take the show to a, a widening, a widening, an ever widening audience. Yes. Gosh, yeah. I can't speak. Before we talk about Cancun, let's um, let's just do some follow-ups on last on the last episode, episode number three. Yeah, the the one thing I wanted to um, just sort of remind readers of, we talked about the um, the sort of warm Arctic cold continents thing that's happening in the northern hemisphere, where um, the Arctic is much warmer than normal, and the cold air that was up there. Um, is spilling down over northwestern Europe. Well, two weeks on, um, that same weather pattern is still there. It's still colder than 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 average in Western Europe, particularly in Britain. Uh, they still expect it to con- carry on that way. And I uh, was looking at uh, a weather map for the North Atlantic um, at, at the, this morning, first thing, and it was quite remarkable. Instead of westerly winds blowing across the Atlantic, which is generally what you know makes Britain a, a wet and windy place, um, there are easterly winds blowing across the North Atlantic from Norway down through Greenland. I thought that was um, quite a remarkable picture. It's not something you see very often. But the, um, the, the, the hot Arctic cold continents thing is continuing and it'll be very, very interesting to see how much longer this winter that particular pattern continues. Mm. One of the one of the comments I noticed in the um, on on hot topic um, in the uh, the comment section for episode number three related to a um, an article I think it was in the Telegraph back in nineteen nine or two thousand from a scientist saying that um, that Britain can expect uh, to to not see much snow snow further into the future and of course we've just seen a bunch of snow and so someone got on there and referred to that article saying hey look told you so look there, there's plenty of snow what's the, what was the scientist talking about he didn't know he didn't have a clue what he was talking about how, how do we put that in context well it's easy enough i mean what we're looking at here is a change in the pattern of weather it's still plenty cold enough for snow um in the northern hemisphere uh, particularly in the northern parts of that so snow isn't going to go away anytime soon it may become less frequent But what's happening here is that the bits of the northern hemisphere that are supposed to be cold are changing, uh, apparently. Mm. Um, And if 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 that's this sort of redistribution of the weather um, may bring more snow to some areas and more warmth to others. So let's not forget that while Britain and Norway and Scandinavia are cold, um, actually over northwestern Canada, it's 10 or 15 degrees Celsius warmer than usual. So, you know, what's going on here is a redistribution, not necessarily a change. Nevertheless, I mean, it's going to have to get a lot warmer. There'll have to be a lot more warming before it stops snowing in in the Northern Hemisphere in winter. Mm. Although the the scientists referred to in their article did say that there would perhaps be a generation of children growing up in Britain who wouldn't know what it was like to um, to get, get the skis on and go down the road. Yeah, well, that's right. But that generation may be a bit further off than he expected. Mm. Uh, we don't know everything about the weather. We know, and, and the climate system, we do know it can be very variable. Um, but it's the, uh, we really don't know how it's going to respond to uh, all of the kind of impacts we've had on it. Mm. it, it I sometimes describe it as being a bit like, you know, you there's a, a, a whacking great church bell hanging up there and we've given it a hell of a bang with a hammer which through adding all our um, CO2. And the bell hasn't quite started ringing yet, but when it does, it's going to make a hell of a noise. Yeah. I think that's where we are. We're in that sort of awkward moment waiting for the noise to start. And I think we'll talk more on, on that topic um, with Peter Glick a little bit later on in the show. Um, Cancun, it's been and happened. Complete waste of time, Gareth? No, I don't think so. I mean, Barry Coates, who we spoke to in the last issue, um, the last issue of the show, Uh, He blogged at uh, Hot Topic um, saying he felt it was a positive ending to the conference, that 
there had been some good deals done and that the progress had been made. And so the worries that the, the, that the whole UN process might actually end up um, not moving forward, um, they faded. Uh, so there have been some, some good things done there, but there's still this big gap between what the science is telling us we need to be doing in terms of restricting our emissions um, and the, uh, you know, what's actually on the table. Let's just quickly have a look at the, the sort of major areas where, where Cancun achieved something. Uh, one of these was um, in climate aid. That's a, a, cl a new climate green fund was agreed at Cancun um, and the idea is to uh, transfer money from the developed world to the developing world to help them deal with the impacts of climate change. So th there will be some transfer of cash. Um, they've promised that it will be around about a hundred billion dollars a year, that's new US dollars, uh, by 2020, starting at 30 billion a year I think by by 2012. And the idea is to help the third world cope with the changes that are coming that we can't do anything about. You know, they can't be avoided. So that's um, a, a good thing which I think has helped to make a lot of the developed, the, the developing world happier with the, the Cancun process, the UN process. Um, the forestry thing that we talked about with um, Barry, that's uh, had formal backing. Uh, Barry indicated that there were lots of loopholes um, still open uh, and that that will continue to be negotiated over the next year. So that's the, that's for um, developed countries to provide incentives to developing countries to keep their forests? Yeah, absolutely, because one of the easiest ways to reduce um, our emissions is to actually stop cutting down trees. So if we can find mechanisms that work, that keep the tropical rainforests basically, um, in the ground and not and not logging them out, um, we that's a good way to reduce um, our emissions, and it ought to be one of the cheapest ways of doing it. But as Barry said, there are lots of interests involved, and there are all sorts of loopholes that have to be negotiated, so um, or prevented. So mm. let's just see how that one develops. We don't know the exact form of the scheme will take, but uh, it's on the cards. It's being negotiated. It's going forward, and that's a good thing. Okay. The Kyoto Protocol hasn't been ditched. There are two strands of negotiations going on, and the future of the Kyoto Protocol is one of them. And actually, the New Zealand um, uh, minister responsible for climate negotiations, Tim Grosser, um, has been appointed as the chair of that, which is, I think, a bit of a... Hopefully, it will mean that the Kyoto Protocol uh, will get full backing from our government, and I've, hopefully, it will get full backing from all the others as well. It's going to be um, a really tough challenge for him over the coming year because, there's, as we saw during the course of Cancun, um, countries like Japan and the US and Australia and so on keen to go uh, with a different route. So, it's going to be an interesting one to see where we are at the end of the year uh, with that. And the phone's ringing. Um, I know, and I, you know, it's one of those things. I'm not even sure I can tell it to stop. <laughs> anyway, um, I've done it. So, um, the fourth area is technology transfer. That I think they've they formed a committee, and they're going to have a technology transfer centre. Um, but there's very little detail on that. The idea for that is to encourage the uh, developing world to use clean technologies um, in as they develop. Mm. So in other words, instead of going down the, the route of burning coal to um, build their energy systems, well, let's go with um, good clean technologies. So a lot of work to be done in that. And then importantly, the fifth area is that countries agreed, in principle at least, that there should be verification of the emissions cuts they make. In other words, they can't just say, well, we're going to cut by 20% and then go ahead and claim that they've done 20% without having somebody else um, sign off on it. So mm. there's going to be some sort of auditing process. Um, no doubt that will be um, very contentious as the as the negotiations move on, because I really can't imagine that um, it's certainly one of the areas where the U.S. and China were at loggerheads, for instance. So, yeah, interesting one that uh, it's going to happen, or at least uh, it looks as though the um, process has started to make it happen. So that's but, good. But that's would, a, good. would an easy way to summarize this be there, uh, there is an agreement to agree on something in the future, <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I th I, that's pretty fair, actually. I mean, the, the the money is on the table for the for the for the green fund, the cl the climate aid fund. That's good. That's positive, and that will go forward. The other stuff, I think, it, the, the fact that they were able to agree to do these things before we get to South Africa at the same time next year is good because it means that people will be actively instead of milling around not knowing what they were doing, which was pretty much the situation for months after Copenhagen. Um, the, the the process itself is back on track. So, mm. with luck, we'll get a productive year's worth of international negotiations, and hopefully, a deal in in South Africa that will bring about some meaningful cuts. However, the the downside in all this is that the, although the countries all agreed that the commitments they'd made to the Copenhagen Accord, you know, they were still committed to them. When you look at those numbers, um, they really don't do much to get us towards two degrees that we discussed in the last show that the commitments that are on the table put us more in, in the range of three to four degrees right and that really really would be um, pretty disastrous for for the entire planet what we need is emissions cuts of um, 16 percent by 2030 globally that's um, the latest uh, report from um, Friends of the Earth have just done a report on that, looking at the commitments. And 16% of global emissions reduction by 2030 gives us a 70% chance of um, going over, sorry, of, of going under 2 degrees Celsius. Whereas at the moment, the targets that people are looking at give us only a 50, 50 chance mm. of staying under 2 degrees. So there is this, as I said, a big gap between uh, where the emissions are taking us and where we keep saying that we are, we want to be. And hopefully over the next year or two, some of that will, um, will, cut, will, will actually get written down in a way that makes some real scientific sense rather than just a kind of diplomatic or international relations sense. And where is it, where is it going to be next year? Uh, South Africa. What's the, what, what's the name of the, the town, city? Oh, that's a good question. Um, go on, put me on the spot there. Because um, I just, I just figure we could, we could gauge whether or not there's going to be agreement there by just the ring, the sound of the, the place. You know, because the whole Kyoto <laughs> thing. You know, when they, they, I mean, did they know when they were in Kyoto that wow, this would be the, the, you know, the name that, that everyone would be talking Kyoto, Kyoto? Because, because <laughs> if, if, uh, if I said next week I'm off to Kyoto, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's right, that's the climate, that's where they had the climate <laughs> thing. You know, like, it's not like oh yeah, that's where they've got great culture or you know whatever. Um, I mean, you know, do, do we know where it's the, the name of the city? Because that'll that'll really tell us whether uh, or not. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do know the name of the city, but we can't remember it. So, uh, g hang on, hang on a second. It's in one Google of your is, uh, well, it's in one of your posts um, from from a, a few weeks back, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you well, what. If it, if it sounds right, we're going to have an agreement. If not, no, not not that year. We'll have to wait another year. Durban. <laughs> Durban, the Durban Protocol. Mm. Yeah, well, mm, no, no, that's no. interesting. The Durban Protocol sounds like oh, the Durban Protocol. No, don't like the sound yeah, of um, it. Yeah, well, it might have some um, street cred. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, moving. Who knows, Glenn? That, <laughs> Sorry, that, that was an that was an interesting riff, Glenn. Thank you for that. <laughs> moving right along, really. I don't, why do they have me on the show? I don't know. Anyway, let's move, <laughs> move along. Um, they, they had me on the show to find really cool graphics because um, this, uh. this one crossed my tweet stream uh, this week and I was well impressed by it because it, it summarized and really put it up in the stark reality um, what global warming actually looks like over the decades. And it's been put out by NASA, Gareth. Yes, that's right. It's... Uh uh, a lovely little sequence of global maps of temperature, temperature anomalies, so the um, changes, and it runs from the um, 1880s through to the last decade. And it's um, for those of you who are listening in black and white, um, it's on the video version of the show as we speak. And it starts off, um, actually, Glenn, wrote, scroll it down a little bit more. Yes. Got the it actual now. decades are at the top. Yep, it shows no, no, it shows it shows the decades at the bottom. Um, yeah, no, there's one in the top right as well. Oh, is there? Um, yeah. Right. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, I yep. see. Oh, that's okay. helpful. Yep. 
Okay. That's right. So, um, basically, when you start out in the 1880s, you start out with a world that looks blue. There are one or two red spots that sort of pop around as you go through the 20s and 30s. And then in the 40s, the Arctic looks a bit warm and then it cools off again. And then as you get into the 80s and 90s and finally the, 20, the 2010s, the whole world turns red. And it's a, it's a, a really graphic way of appreciating the change changes that have gone on. We're only looking at sort of, um, in some areas, two to three degrees worth of warming, but it, it really gives you a, a clear impression of how in the last 120 odd years uh, times have changed and where those changes have taken place. And it is quite remarkable. You can see mm. that it's the, in the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, it's the center of the Asian continent, the Arctic. It's the, basically the large land masses where most of the warming has gone on which is pretty much exactly what um, climate modelling told us to expect. Interesting, um, from a New Zealand perspective, looking at um, where we are on the map, there's, there was some cooling going on um, sort of in the early part of last century, but generally we haven't been affected so much with the actual warming side of things. Um, I mean, there's a slight pinkishness going on at around about, I think, what is it, the... 1970, yeah, 19, 1970s, 1980s was sort of back to normal, 1990s kind of a little bit cooler. We've seen some yeah. warming in the, in the past decade, but we're not, we haven't got this intense red, red heat that you can see way up in the northern hemisphere towards the Arctic. Yeah, that's because the Southern Ocean um, basically is, 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 first of all, it's huge and it's cold and it acts like a giant air conditioner for, for New Zealand because we're just a small little country stuck deep down into the Southern Ocean. You know, mm. you can't get much further south than us uh, without bumping into Antarctica. So it's keeping us cool and it's, as, as climate change progresses, it should continue to keep us um, cooler than the rest of the world. That doesn't mean physically cooler it means that we'll warm more slowly and that's the expectation mm. but new zealand new zealand's climate is generally dominated by the uh the the southern ocean and the interaction of the southern ocean with the tropics to the north and so as we go through the century you're going to see the tropics expanding southwards towards the north island and uh, probably an intensification. We've already seen an intensification of the westerly winds that go whizzing around Antarctica. Um, they may well intensify even further, and that will mean kind of more rain on the west coast, more drought on the east coast, generally getting warmer from the north. So, yeah, you know, we're not going to be immune. If we're lucky, we simply won't suffer as much as the rest of the world. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, well, let's um, let's now um, or very shortly bring on our guest for the show, which is um, Peter Glick. Uh, but uh, first of all, um, let's talk about hot hot topic because this is where the, um, the the current home for the show is, the climate show at Hot Topic, and it's also a great place to have a discussion once the show's gone up as well. Yes, um, as as always, we're, we're we're very pleased to be involved with the show. Um, glad to do it. Um, I'm feeling a bit guilty this week because I went away for a few days on a um, hedonistic rafting trip down the Clarence River, which was absolutely beautiful. Did you? Um, I, really rec I really recommend it to anyone. If you want to be able to um, have some fun, go down the, the Clarence River with the Clarence River Rafting Company. It's such a beautiful part of the world. Um, clean water, um, good wine even. <laughs> anyway, so while I was away, Brian Walker, my clothes bogger, has been basically... Um, uh, blogging up a storm with some great posts on on interesting subjects. So my thanks to Brian for holding the baby whilst I was away. But hopefully I'll start to pull my own my own weight a little bit more in, as we come up to Christmas. Great. And if um, if, if you have been um, just listening to the audio, and sometimes we are talking about some of these graphics, don't panic because all the links are up on the um, the hot topic post for the show. Um, and yeah. Yep. It's all up there. I try to make sure that the show notes include links to just about everything that we talk to. So yeah. um, you can you can follow um, even if you can't see the pictures, you can follow the follow the the, the detail anyway. Hmm. So off you go. Hot hyphen topic dot co dot nz. All right. Well, let's bring on our um, feature guest for this episode. So it really is a, a pleasure to have um, Peter Glick on. He's the president of the Pacific Institute. He's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. 
and he joins us from the American Geophysical Union Congress in San Francisco. A whole bunch of talks going on there. It's the world's largest earth science meeting and he's here to tell us about the latest developments in climate science. Hello to you, Peter. Uh, hello, happy to be here. Thank you very much for, for, for agreeing to do the show, Peter. It's, um, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you on. It's not every day I get a, a chance to speak to a, a real MacArthur genius. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So what's, um, what I thought we might touch on is what I really wanted to find out was what's hot at the AGU? What are the things that are, are really keeping the scientists up at night talking and discussing? I, I know it's a huge a huge program, everything from the minutiae of planetary atmospheres to um, what's going on inside volcanoes. But obviously in the climate science field, there's a huge amount going on as well. So what's, what's the, the, the scuttlebutt? Well, the American Geophysical Union conference every year is enormous. Uh, the, the fall conference is always in San Francisco. There are tens of thousands of geophysicists and climate scientists and volcanologists wandering around the streets of San Francisco. Uh, and often climate is a big part of the hundreds of talks that occur during this week. Uh, and this year's no exception. If, if anything, there's more going on about climate than ever before, uh, in part because there's more going on globally about climate than ever before. The, the climate continues to worsen, the science continues to strengthen, uh, and so we get, we're get we getting talks about uh, climate models and what they tell us, we're getting talks about observations, about how the actual climate is being seen to change, uh, we're getting talks about communications about climate, how scientists ought to talk to the media or to the public or to policymakers. Uh, it's been a very exciting year for the climate, if you will. Uh, that, that's true, and possibly not in ways that we would we would all like. But I'd like to come back to the issue of um, how climate scientists are communicating the science to policymakers um, a little later on. Uh, sure. I'm interested in in this thing that the observations are steadily worsening. What what's what's struck you in the in what you've heard so far? Well, we're increasingly seeing evidence from all over the world uh, that temperatures are rising and they're rising faster than we expected, that precipitation patterns are changing uh, with some places getting wetter, some places getting drier, but perhaps more worrisome that more and more places are seeing more extreme precipitation. Uh, we're getting uh, more intense precipitation. We're getting more precipitation over shorter periods of time, uh, we're seeing more and more evidence that snowpack is disappearing from our mountains and that glaciers are receding faster and faster. These are things that we've been seeing for years, but uh, more and more climate scientists are collecting more and more evidence that backs up our expectations and in fact that suggests climate, may be climate change may be happening faster than even our models suggested it would happen. Yeah, this question of extremes, though, is one that it's very difficult to address in a in a sound bite, isn't it? It's it, if you're in the middle of a an extreme downpour, whether that be the the floods in in um, in Tennessee earlier this year, or the in exceptionally heavy snowfalls that occurred actually in the last few days in in the U.S. Um, I think more precipitation extremes were broken in the last few days through snowfall than, than cold temperature records. It was uh, quite remarkable. But it's really hard if, you know, these things are by, by very nature relatively rare events. And if you don't experience them, um, you know, you don't, you don't appreciate them. And it's also really hard to attribute them to climate change. You, what's your feeling about how we can talk about this? Yeah, yes, that's a very good point. Um, I guess the first thing to understand is that uh, we see extremes of climate all the time. Climate is naturally variable. Uh, we get wet years, we get dry years, we get hot temperatures, we get cold temperatures. Um, the natural variability of the climate is a fundamental characteristic of the climate. And so one of the complications in the debate about climate is 
it's very easy for people who really believe in climate change, as I do, to look at extremes, you know, extra hot weather or uh, even ex ex extra cold weather or extra wet weather and think, okay, this is evidence of climate change. Um, and it's easy for climate deniers to say, look, it's, it's cold outside. It's cold in Washington right now. So how could the earth be warming up? Um, that's a complication. That's a, that's a difficulty for the public. And so what we really have to do is you have to look not at weather, that is what's happening today, but at long-term averages of weather. And that's really the, that's what the climate is. Uh, and you have to look at long-term average changes and you have to look at trends. And if you look at the trends rather than individual events, that's really what makes us worry about climate change. We're seeing trends where it's not just hot or cold today, but it's hotter or colder for a long period of time, or we're getting extremes of temperature that we didn't expect. And so here's another way to look at it. Um, we would expect there to be record hot temperatures being set somewhere around the world, even without climate change. We would expect there to be record cold temperatures being set somewhere around the world, even without climate change. And we see those things. But we're seeing record hot temperatures being set far more often than record cold temperatures. And that's what we expect with a global, uh, a planet that's warming on the whole. And so that's another indication that the climate really is changing and that the Earth is warming up. But um, Peter, I guess, I guess this is an issue, um, particularly in the reporting of um, of climate change issues. But this is an issue um, right across the board with news news and current affairs, isn't it? Because um, let's say a bomb goes off somewhere in um, in Israel, um, that's reported as a bomb going off in Israel, but it's never really reported in the context of um, a wider conflict or a conflict that's gone on for many years and many decades. Um, and it's the same for climate change, isn't it? We'll report on a so snowstorm, but it's not seen in the context of the whole issue itself. Well, that, that's right. We love to talk about the weather. It's much harder to talk about the climate. That is the long-term average of the weather. And um, uh, so it's, good, it's easy for the media to talk about snowstorms or extreme heat events or floods events in Pakistan. And, of course, those are terrible things. The flooding in Pakistan was a horrible thing from the, from the point of view of the people affected by it, the millions and millions of people affected by it. And we don't know whether that was caused by global climate change. But we do know that global climate change is loading the dice. It's, it, and that's the best way to think about it. We're loading the dice. We're making it much more likely that we're going to get hot extremes. We're making it much more likely that the extremes are going to be worse than they would otherwise have been. Uh, and maybe that's the way the media ought to think about it. That's the, the way the public ought to be shown that climate change is going to be a problem. We're loading the dice. We're, we're affecting the probability that extreme events are going to happen more and more often. Yes, that's that's um, that's a, a key point. And the other thing that strikes me, and it's something we discussed on the sh the last issue of the show, is that, that sometimes the changes that are happening are changes to patterns of weather. And so the um, at the moment, for instance, the warm Arctic cold continents pattern can be seen um, in the northern hemisphere, where the Arctic is much warmer than normal, and the cold air that should be up there is actually now down over northwestern Europe and, and central Russia and parts of the US, whereas, um, you know, which is exactly the same thing that happened last year. So is that coincidence or is it climate change? It's a difficult question to answer. It, it is. A, the, whole, the whole issue of detection is a very difficult one. And 10 or 20 years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about, well, when would we ever really know enough to say that what we're seeing is climate change rather than variability? Um, but the truth is that over time, over the last decade or so, the changes have been so fast and so consistent and so extreme that, and, and from so many different parts of the world, uh, not just geographically, but uh, from patterns of temperature and patterns of rainfall and patterns of, of migrations of animals and uh, patterns of uh, the flowering of plants, the, the evidence has just continued to pile up 
that the climate is changing, it's changing rapidly, and it's changing because of human human activities. So that that's part of what's going on at the American Geophysical Union this week. More and more evidence from all of these different pieces of of the science uh, that all are coming together in ways that ought to make us more and more worried about what we're doing to the planet. Is is, is there some evidence um, that has um, has been brought up at this conference that uh, the public would be quite surprised about that they may not have heard about before? I think there's always, you know, that's always a challenge for scientists to, to talk talk to the public, and some are good about it, some are good and some are bad about it. Um, but I do think that there there is uh, a whole series of pieces of scientific information that com- are coming out of this conference that would help the public understand the nature of the changes that are happening. Um, uh, we, we tend to talk about global warming as just warming. Uh, and I think that's a disservice to the public because, in fact, global warming is only one piece of this complicated set of changes about climate. And it it does have to do with water availability and ice melting and impacts on animals, the health of polar bears and the, the migratory patterns of birds. And, and if, if you put it all together, there's one piece or another that somebody out there in the public is really going to be interested in or worried about. Uh, that's going to be important to them and help them understand the kinds of changes we see. So has there been any one particular piece of evidence presented at the AGU that that struck you as as remarkable or particularly interesting? Well, I, I wouldn't say there was anything radically new for me, except in the sense that the weight of the evidence uh, continues to pile up. Um, the the presentations at the American Geophysical Union are of two kinds. There are scientific talks, and then there are what we call poster sessions, where a student or a young scientist typically will produce a poster, a big piece of paper that they put on the wall, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of these posters being presented. Um, and I love to look at the posters, because the posters uh, produce far more information than the individual talks. The, the, there are lots of talks, but there are many more posters. And there were just a remarkable number of posters with a remarkable amount of evidence from a remarkable, remarkably diverse set of scientific organizations and individuals that, that are showing changes in, in water availability. My particular interest is in water, the impacts of climate change on water resources. And uh, there's just a lot of evidence from the hydrologic community that we're seeing changes, impacts of climate change on water availability and water quality and extreme events. Uh, it's uh, it's worrisome for someone who really cares about the water problems of the world. Yeah, okay. Now, the other major theme um, that seems to have been emerging at the AGU is this business of communication, of getting the scientific message over because as regular listeners and viewers of the climate show will well know, we, um, we interviewed Naomi Oreskes a, a, a couple of shows ago. And uh, there is this sort of coordinated campaign out there to undermine and, and to misrepresent the evidence that, as you say, is, is accumulating so, so fast. And of course, um, Scientists are not always the best communicators, and uh, they tend to be specialists. They tend to be well informed about narrow areas, and perhaps not well equipped to to deal with people who are taking a kind of loyally approach um, to to the or a rhetorical approach to the whole debate. So there's been this big development in terms of um, scientists looking to to fight back. How's that been playing out? It it's a it's a growing area of interest for scientists. Scientists are frustrated, I believe, at the ability of a very, very small but very uh, focused and well-funded and vocal community of climate skeptics and climate deniers who push their special interests and try to sow doubt about the science of climate change. And um, uh, they've been pretty successful. They've been especially successful, I would argue, at not just confusing the public, but especially confusing policymakers. They, they've made it very easy, if you will, for policymakers to say, oh, we don't know enough to take action. Um, and I think the scientific community is frustrated at that and is looking at ways to improve their communications. 
uh, to counter the arguments of these skeptics and uh, really to push back. And I, I, think, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think there are some very good science communicators, and I think they need to work at getting the message out. Uh, and I think they're, they're trying harder. I think they're learning new techniques for communicating more, more and more effectively. Um, the skeptics will never go away. The deniers will never go away. I think they're increasingly desperate because, first of all, the science is clearly against them. And I think the message is, is getting out that the science is against them. Um, but it's going to be a long fight. There was a long fight with tobacco, uh, which used a lot of the same tools as Naomi Oreskes talked about in her book. Uh, uh, it was long after the science of the health impacts of tobacco was clear that policymakers finally got around to doing something about it. And I think it's going to be true for climate change. Uh, the yeah. deniers are, are going to continue to make it difficult for policymakers to act. But the science there, gets stronger and stronger. Absolutely. And there are still people who believe that the world is flat. So there, there will be yes. um, a, a sort of rump of skeptics out there for, 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 for some time to come. But I guess I guess also this one's kind of different, though, in some ways as well, because the, the effects of tobacco stayed constant on a particular um, individual. But uh, as I understand the science, the effects of climate change will only increase and, um, and get worse. So th there's a slight difference there, isn't there? Well, that's, that's true. Um, the longer it took for us to regulate tobacco, uh, the more people were getting sick and dying. And now that we're regulating tobacco, and in some countries, smoking incidence is going down, the health effects of tobacco uh, are going down as well. Now, that's not true globally, because, of course, the tobacco companies have simply moved their efforts to countries that don't regulate tobacco that well. Uh, but it's also certainly true that the the more successful climate deniers are, and the more we delay taking action to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, the worse climate change is going to be. Uh, the, the truth is we only have three options. We can uh, reduce greenhouse gases and mitigate the effects of climate change. We can adapt to the unavoidable consequences of climate change, or we can suffer the consequences. And really the question is what's gonna be the proportion of those three things? Uh, the longer we delay reducing emissions, the longer skeptics and deniers are successful at preventing policymakers from taking action, the more adaptation and the more suffering we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with. Yes, I think it was Lonnie Thompson um, in a recent um, article uh, paper in a uh, I'm trying to I can't remember the name of the journal, but I'll stick the I'll stick the link in the um, show notes. Um, talking about uh, have we have a we have to choose the balance between the amount of suffering that we're willing to um, to experience and the amount of effort we we have to put into uh, to mitigating and adapting. Yes, uh, that, that's exactly right. But you know that that point that we really have a balance between mitigation, adaptation, and suffering is one that a number of communicators have been trying to get across for quite a while. And I thought Lonnie's paper was excellent. Uh, it made a very good point, and it came from a source that, that you know, Lonnie's a great scientist, but he hasn't been that vocal in the past, and I think it's a good indication of a little bit of the frustration of the scientific community that has not been that active in talking to the public uh, in realizing that they, they have to get out there and respond to these, these deniers. Yeah, I've got the quote in front of me now. It says, sooner or later, we will all deal with global warming. The only question is how much we will mitigate, adapt and suffer. And that's really a, a pretty um, strong message. It just, you know, policymakers, however, um, don't seem to be listening. Uh, at the top of the show, we were talking about the, um, the, 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 the results of the Cancun conference and the mix between progress that's been made and yet this yawning gap between what the science is actually telling us about the the need to stick to a fairly strict carbon budget if to avoid really damaging change and the actual targets that people are considering um, is there any sense of frustration do you think in 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 the scientists at the AGU about this this failure of of policymakers to pick up on the the both the seriousness of uh, and the and the consequences of of inaction I I think absolutely there's a sense of frustration uh I think the truth is 
most of us no longer expect the global policymakers to take action fast enough to avoid very serious climate change. We're already committed to quite substantial climate change. Uh, even if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, which of course we're not going to do, um, there's a tremendous amount of climate change already embedded in the system. And I don't see any evidence that we're actually going to take serious actions to reduce greenhouse gases anytime soon. And that means there's going to be more and more climate change and more and more committed greenhouse gas consequences. Uh, uh, the, the question is, you know, what are the tipping points? When do we reach a point when the Arctic becomes ice free, when we really start to see mass extinctions of, of animals, when sea level rise goes up so fast that island nations are irreversibly flooded or Bangladesh, parts of Bangladesh are irreversibly flooded. Um, we're going to see more and more climate change. And I, I, I think I think that's too bad because we've wasted several decades that were critical uh, in reducing the overall impacts that we're going to experience. And that, that, that's a question I, I really want to ask, though. Do you, is there a particular event that, that you think, Peter, that, um, that may happen that would be the tipping point, that would um, change policy, that would, uh, on a global scale, make everyone stop and, and change the direction that we're going? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, a lot of the climate changes that we're going to see are going to be incremental. Sea level is going to go up incrementally. The glaciers are going to disappear incrementally. Storm patterns, you know, storms are, are individual events and we may see more extreme storms. Um, but even there, some of these changes are going to be incremental. And that's not, a, not going to help policymakers make a decision. Um, it is possible that we will see tipping points. We will see what we call thresholds. We will see all of a sudden extreme events, such as a really massive loss of ice from Antarctica or Greenland that raises sea level not by the millimeter, but by the, you know, by the foot. Mm. Uh, that, that would be a disastrous event. Um, we might see, although we don't expect it at the moment in the science community, the abrupt shutoff of the, the Gulf Stream in the, in the Atlantic mm. Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean that would suddenly plunge parts of Northern Europe into a much colder climate, ironically enough, uh, because it's transferring less warmth up to the Northern part of the Northern hemisphere. We, we could see some of these threshold events. Um, part of the problem is that as climate scientists, we don't understand threshold events very well. It is one of the difficult things for the science community to model. Um, but. But that would certainly, that potentially, those kinds of events potentially could stimulate the policy community to act quickly. But of course, at that point, it's too late. And of course, it's currently, it's, you know, this is stuff that only Hollywood at the moment can fully imagine. Right. Hollywood, Hollywood does those sorts of things very well. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, the, the, we, we just don't know what we can really expect. Mm. Yes, it's interesting. I know that there's evidence... Um, during the um, the deglaciation uh, after the at the end of the ice age that uh, the the northern hemisphere weather could reorganize in as little as as one year between a relatively mild climate and a relatively cold climate and that's a a, a pretty worrying uh, finding for people living in the northern hemisphere i mean you could argue almost that the sort of weather that they're experiencing in, in, in Western Europe at the moment is a, is a symptom of precisely that sort of change. But um, let's not go there. <laughs> um, well, we, we, do, we do worry about what we don't know. Um, there's no climate scientist that would argue we know everything about climate. There's no climate scientist that will argue there aren't uncertainties that are, or, or what they would argue that our models are perfect. We, we know that there are uncertainties. Um, unfortunately, and we love to talk about uncertainties because that's part of science, but unfortunately in the last few years, um, the evidence has been coming in faster and faster that the uncertainties may be, we may be wrong on the wrong side of things, that climate change may happen faster than we expected, not slower than we expected, which some of the skeptics and deniers are arguing, um, and, and that's particularly worrisome. Yes, it's an interesting thing that... Um their their position the, the position they're adopting is is a lose lose position um arguing for an action is exactly the worst thing that you can do because they're basically relying on the laws of physics being wrong 
Um, and I don't, I don't think that's a bet that any sensible or rational individual would want, would want to take. Um, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're wrong from so many points of view. It's, <laughs> it's sometimes <laughs> hard, to, hard to get a handle on which wrong you're talking to. <laughs> I did read a very interesting blog post this week um, by a guy who was arguing that the um, the ironic, if you like, although it might be very sad, um, implication of of what these guys have have done by delaying action is is have made the, they will have made the problem so bad that when governments and the international community finally get round to taking the necessary action, they will do so by uh, a wartime response that will, uh, um, hmm. you know, cripple markets and liberties far more effectively than, you know, a cap and trade scheme or or something similar. Yes, that's exactly right. That's a, that's a huge irony. And uh, let me give you a great example of that. Um, we have failed miserably in the United States to get our policymakers, our Congress, to pass a cap and trade to to actually try and develop market mechanisms that tax schemes that can try and use markets and use um, the tools of capitalism, use the tools of economics to address the issue of climate change. Now, conservatives in this country argue all the time for free markets, and they argue for, for economic tools to address environmental problems rather than regulatory tools, because they don't like regulation. They don't like the idea of big government. And so ironically, our failure to use market tools, our failure to get Congress to apply cap and trade or cap and tax or something like that, means the only tool left to us is a regulatory approach. And the US EPA, which regulates pollutants, is trying to regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant. That's the only tool left to us. And what do you know? The conservatives are up in arms about that. They say, look, it's government regulation. And yet we've sort of been forced into that by the failure to to move toward market mechanisms. It's pretty ironic to me. Yeah, well, it's ironic. It's also incredibly sad. Um, Peter, do you see a way forward in all of this? Do you think that rationality can win the day? Do you think we have a hope in hell, basically? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm very bad at predicting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not good at forecasting climate. I'm much less good at forecasting what our policymakers are going to do. <laughs> um, I do believe that climate change is occurring. I do believe it's clearly because of human activities. Um, I do believe that there are effective things that we can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that would benefit us in terms of changing our energy system, moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, in the United States, that would permit us to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, which has an economic benefit, it has a political advantage, it has a national security advantage. Um, uh, we're beginning to push forward on green energy, on renewables, on photovoltaics and wind turbines and geothermal. Uh, we are beginning to see an acceleration of effort in that area, in the area of energy efficiency, which of course helps us reduce greenhouse gas emis emissions. I do believe the science of climate change continues to strengthen and the public, although it's not as well informed as I would like, is becoming better informed. Um, so I, I think there's reason for optimism, but we're not going to avoid some climate change. And I think it's not enough to simply focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We'd better start really thinking about how we can make our water systems more robust, our food systems more ro robust, how we can develop coastal policies so that we can move populations out of harm's way from sea level rise. We have a lot to do and, and increasingly less time to do it. And um, Peter, seeing this as our, as our last um, show for, for 2010, um, and I know uh, you've just given some indications of what to expect already, but do you have one prediction for, for 2010? Uh, for, sorry, for 2011 for us. Well, it's going to be another record warm year. Um, we're going to see uh, increasing evidence of sea level rise and melting from land ice in Antarctica and Greenland. I think we're going to see more and more open ocean in the Arctic, uh, I just think the evidence will continue to accumulate. Mm. Uh, it's harder for me to see what's going to happen on the policy front, but hopefully we'll see more rapid development of alternative energy systems and more rapid deployment of alternative energy systems. And even without efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the policy side, uh, I hope we'll make progress.
Hmm. Well, amen to that. I think we 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 all um, would like to see a lot more progress than currently seems to be on the cards. Um, Peter, I'd just like to thank you very much for taking so much time out of your day. I know you're a busy man, and I know it's a very busy time when, as you say, thousands of um, geophysicists are uh, rattling around the streets of San Francisco. It must be a very strange time for the inhabitants of the city. Um, but thank you <laughs> very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for helping with this important effort of trying to communicate uh, both the science and the policy to the public. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Yeah, You're thanks. Welcome. Thanks, Peter Glick. Um, that is the Peter, uh, Peter Glick, the president of the Pacific Institute, joining us from the world's largest science, Earth Science meeting, the American Geophysical Union Congress in San Francisco. Well, that was great to have um, Peter on, Gareth. Um, I hope to maybe get him back in the new year. He's always blogging over at the Huffington Post, so depending on what he's talking about, we, we might get him back on. Yeah, absolutely. He's um, a real expert in in water resource issues, and and uh, yeah, yeah there, there's bound to be something that we can talk to him about in the future. Mm. Really interesting guy. Yeah. So let's move on to the next segment uh, with John Cook over at uh, skepticalscience.com. Hello to you, John. G'day, Glenn. Mm. Hi, John. How are you doing? Yeah. Hi, Gareth. It's um it's getting warm again in Brisbane. Yes, it must be those um, those ashes you're about to give back to the English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm a bit um, despondent about that, but maybe we can turn things around today. Yeah, absolutely. Good well, luck. You, good luck with that. And you, you haven't been watching the cricket anyway. You've been, you've been at a um, a, a conference. You said a workshop. Yes. Uh, well, fortunately, the conference didn't uh, conflict with the Ashes, which start today. But um, yeah, yesterday I was at a just a climate change uh, a workshop on how to communicate. Uh, climate science and just just looking at the whole social science side of it which was which is really fascinating which was actually one of the things we were just talking about with peter and this um this kind of battle that that is obviously being done with the skeptics in the media to um to get the spotlight in the right place but also how to communicate um the uh, what are quite complicated issues in a way that everyone can understand and also see the wider picture rather than just individual events and see them as a as a link sequence as well yeah, I, I mean, there's there's just so many interlocking parts in this whole picture that that are, and you you have to really take in you know take everything into account. Like, I mean, there is this um, disinformation campaign, but just even human psychology is is extraordinarily complicated, mm. and, and it makes it makes climate science look easy in comparison. Because mm. uh, I mean, because people are complicated. A, that's why. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I'm learning, and and I'm coming to the conviction that um. The whole climate science issue now is is more a social science issue than a physical science issue. Yeah. Like the the physical scientists really have have done their job in that they've you know they've given us a clear picture, and now now we have to um, motivate you know people to to change. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, along the lines that that Peter Glick was saying that the um, you know the balance of evidence is now so overwhelming. That it's the the disconnect with with the policy arena is so so extreme that it's going to have to come back together at some point, and the 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 interesting the interesting discussion is about how and when and and yeah does it have to involve disasters before people will will pay attention? Mm. Yeah. Today we're going to be looking at climate sensitivity. Um, I gave a very quick overview of what that meant at the top end of the show, John, but um, I'll, def I'll defer to you. So climate sensitivity, what is it? Well, um, I guess it, it just is... 140 yeah. characters, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, climate sensitivity is just a measure of how sensitive our climate is to a change in heat. So when, when you add heat to our climate, how much does temperature go up? Um, so, so for example, we know that if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's going to add um, you know, a certain amount of heat, and the direct warming from that is about roughly one degree Celsius. But, but on top of that, then once you get all this warming, then you get all these feedbacks. You get positive feedbacks which amplify the warming, and negative feedbacks which damp down the warming. So when you add up all these individual feedbacks, what's the overall result? And, and that's what climate sensitivity is. Hmm. And uh, you've been looking at Andrew Dessler's paper on, on cloud feedback. Yeah, so, um, so one of the strongest feedbacks 
uh, in the climate system is when it gets warmer, uh, we get more evaporation and, and more humidity in the like more water vapor in the atmosphere. And this has a whole range of effects. So water vapor is a greenhouse gas, so that causes warming. But when you've got more more water vapor in the air, you also get more clouds. So and then clouds have all their own bunch of complications. Um, clouds reflect sunlight, so mm -hmm. that causes cooling. But they also trap heat coming up from the surface, so that causes warming. So so a big question is what is the cloud feedback? Is is that going to cause more warming, or or is it going to cool things down? And Andrew Dessler published a, a paper just over the last week that uh, examined observations to try and answer this question. So what he looked at was our satellite measurements of how much heat was trapped by clouds and then he compared it to surface temperature measurements. And so what, did he, wanted, what he wanted to see was what happened as it got warmer or as it got co colder, what did the clouds do? And what he found was as it got warmer, the clouds trapped more heat. So he, this was evidence for positive feedback. Uh, but there was still a bit of uncertainty with his result. There was a slight chance of a small negative feedback, but a, but a much greater chance of positive feedback. Cloud feedback is just one little element. Uh, to find the overall climate sensitivity, what, what you really want to do is uh, look at um, past climate change, work out how much heat has changed in the past, and then see what temperature did in response. And one of the key, key parts of that, John, isn't it, is the, the change from glaciations to interglacial periods so you get a, a warming of a, what I guess about five degrees Celsius on the average from the depths of an ice age up to the peak of an interglacial and you get a change in CO2 from roughly 180 part per million to 280 parts per million and so you can use that to um, get a handle on what the climate sensitivity is. is that would be fair wouldn't it? Yeah, that's that's one of the best um, periods um, where you can work out climate sensitivity. So uh, roughly about 20,000 years ago, we were in an ice age, like a global ice age, and then the planet yeah, warmed about five degrees as we came out of the ice age. So because of such dramatic warming, and and we can work out uh, how much heat was trapped by um, by the change in ice sheets and by the change in CO2, you know, we can work out what climate you know what climate sensitivity is how much does global temperature change in response to this heat change and and what they what we found from those results is um, again a net positive feedback and a climate sensitivity of about three degrees which means that um, if you have one degree of initial warming positive feedbacks roughly triple the amount huh. and take it take it from one degree to three degrees but but that's I mean that's one period. But then we've looked at other, going further back um, millions of years, and looking at um, uh, in the deep past, we get the same result. The the one degree is amplified to three degrees. Does does this have implications for geoengineering? You know, and 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 techniques to mitigate climate change. Well, I mean, geoengineering is there's actually a lot more uncertainty with that than than uh, the effects from carbon dioxide because like for example one one way to geoengineer would be to send all this um, like send sulfate little particles up into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight and mm. cool, cool the atmosphere but that that has a whole range of other little flow-on effects like like it can cause acid rain and it can cause changes in the circulation um, and yeah it's it's a pretty dodgy um, dodgy sort of enterprise at this point and, and it doesn't change the fact that even even if it does cause um, cancel out the warming still all the CO2 is going up into the atmosphere it's uh, causing acidification and and it's we would have to keep adding more and more um, you know geoengineering solutions to cancel out the more and more CO2 warming mm. Mm. so it's not, it's not a long-term solution just to come back to the, the question of sensitivity, one of the things that I've often um, thought uh, is that we look at the climate sensitivity, it's a sort of theoretical number based on a, um, a very complex, but effectively when you look at, for instance, the, last, the, the change from glacial maximum to interglacial, you're looking at a system basically that humanity's had no impact on. Um, 
And the situation as we go forward is with a fundamentally different planet because we've chopped down huge quantities of forests and we've we've added huge amounts of carbon dioxide, methane and other stuff into the atmosphere. So um, it doesn't seem to me that there's necessarily a guarantee that a doubling of CO2 will actually only give us three degrees Celsius. And I think, um, wouldn't it be fair to say that it's easier to say that it won't be less than one degree, but it's harder to rule out the, um, the, the sort of higher end numbers? Um, well, there's, there's a, yeah, I mean, there's, when you look at the, um, the, like the probability uh, distribution functions, which, which is just, you know, what's the likelihood of, of climate sensitivity? Yeah, but what, what you find is it sharply drops off at around two degrees. So, so we're f very confident that climate sensitivity is at least two degrees and, and that we have net positive feedback. But then the graph sort of spreads out as you get higher up and it's harder to rule out the, the big values. And, and that's actually a, a necessary um, a feature of, of any climate system with positive feedback. Um, as If you have positive feedback, it just skews the likelihood towards, towards higher responses. And um, that means that when, when people talk about uncertainty and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty with climate science, the uncertainty actually skews towards higher values. So uh, any uncertainty in climate science isn't an excuse to, to not do anything. You know, it, it should actually motivate us to, um, to work harder to avoid, you know, potentially bad situations. Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, as you say, if you've got this long tail out to six, seven degrees and more, um, those are so such a bad consequence of, of of our actions that it's worth paying quite a high price to avoid them because it would pretty much um, end life as we know it, wouldn't it? It's warming at that sort of scale. Well, my my personal conviction is that it's it's fairly likely that the climate sensitivity is is around three degrees. Uh, and the reason for that is because we have all these different lines of evidence all pointing to a, a most likely value of around three. So, so while you can't rule out um, higher sensitivities, uh, I think the body of evidence now is pointing towards most likely around three degrees. And, and that's, and that's the, um, what, what the IPCC results are, are giving us as well. So, so, I mean, that still paints a fairly serious situation. and. You know, if we if we double CO two, we're looking at you know three degrees warming, and e even two degrees warming would cause uh, some some pretty nasty consequences on humanity. So, I should say that John's got a really cool graphic which comes from um, uh, the Skeptical Science website, but I think it actually comes from a a paper, doesn't it, John, which shows all of the different um, estimations of of uh, climate sensitivity. Yeah, I don't suppose you're able to get that picture up here mm. in the video, are you? Yep, yep, it's up there now. Oh, great. Okay, so yes, this is a paper by um, Nati and Her Hergel. I'm not sure how to pronounce their names, but um, what they've done is just they just wrote a paper synthesizing all the different studies in the climate sensitivity, and uh, using all different methods, using modeling, using observations, volcanoes, that that period when we came out of the last ice age, and and going back millions of years. And, and all these bodies, you know, all this data is all pointing at a most likely value of three degrees. And, and I think that's the, the main point to remember when, when discussions of sensitivity start getting bogged down uh, into cloud feedback or, or, you know, just this isolated paper here or there that, that suggests that maybe there's negative sensitivity. Um, there's, there's, a, there's all these different lines of evidence that are all pointing to, towards a single answer. And and just to take one little paper that might point in the opposite direction is really ignoring the full body of it. Very good point. Well, um, you've also um, got a um, a PDF now up at um, Skeptical Science called the uh, Scientific Guide of Global Warming Skepticism. Tell us about this. Yeah, a, a few months ago, um, Scott Mandia um, emailed me suggesting he, he wanted to um, distribute this uh, little booklet I'd made. Uh, the scientific guide to the skeptics handbook uh, to science teachers. Now this was a guide I'd just, a little handbook I'd written that was just um, debunking a specific 
book it booklet here in Australia. But I thought, well, probably better than that would be to create a general book that just talked about global warming skepticism in general. So I offered to create create this um, this general guide. And so what I what I decided was there was two main points that that I think you need to communicate about the climate debate. Uh, and the first point is that there's there's a full body of evidence all pointing to a, a single consistent answer. And just like we you know we discussed with climate sens sensitivity, where it's, it's all pointing to um, you know positive feedback. Similarly, we have all these human fingerprints uh, that we see throughout climate change, pointing to um, to the fact that humans are changing changing our climate. Mm. Uh, and so, and then the second point I wanted to make was that the the way that climate skeptic arguments usually mislead is by cherry picking from the data and just taking one little factoid that that um, and ignoring the rest of the evidence which again like using climate sensitivity like taking a single paper that finds low sensitivity and ignoring all the evidence for high sensitivity so yeah I guess there was so I just I just created this guide that had a series of um, went through all the different fingerprints human fingerprints on climate change uh, and also uh, explain some of the methods that climate skeptics arguments use to uh, cherry pick the data and, and ignore all the evidence. Great, and that's available up at uh, skepticalscience.com. Yeah, I just want to give it a, a, a good plug because it's a really clear um, and well presented guide to the very basic arguments that skeptics use, why they don't work when you look at the big picture. Um, so it runs through all of the items of evidence that um, John mentioned briefly there mm. with really neat, clear graphics. Um, I just think um, kudos for doing it, John. It's mm. a fantastic booklet. Oh, it was fun doing it. Uh, when um, Once I put it together, we uh, showed it to a, a bunch of scientists and, and also to all the guys who've, who've written stuff on skeptical science. And and I found actually the, the skeptical science guys were the... the most brutal um, <laughs> reviewers. They were just nitpicking everything to the tiniest detail. Hmm. So, so that was a that was a good experience. Yeah, the graphics are excellent too. Um, I I'd, I'd really I really appreciate. I, I like to think in 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 good images, and you've certainly got some great ones in there. So, as I say, well done, John. It's it's a great thing, and hmm. I recommend uh, all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, it's it's well worth a download. And, and uh, John, but just before we um, before we let you go, um, just some um, there was a, a, a we sub note to an earlier episode where we were talking about the Twitter bot that um, would uh, automatically go out and um, debunk debunk a skeptical arguments on Twitter. Say if someone tw tweeted about something about um, climate change, a, a typical argument like um, it's the sun that's doing it or something along those lines, there would be an automatic um, tweet back. And I tried it live um, when we were recording the show, but I didn't get a tweet back. But you heard back from Nigel about that, who's, yeah, the, who's he, the developer. He listened to um, to the climate show, so it's good to see you've got... Um You've got at least uh, Nigel subscribing to, yeah. uh, to the podcast, <laughs> and and he said that the reason why it didn't respond was because he already had your Twitter account in his list of um, you know people not to respond to. Ah. so so the system works. So uh, pre to prevent false positives, I think false, right. false positives. Yeah. He also mentioned that um that I think there was a blog post on perhaps it was What's Up with that that was um discussing his bot. And on there, he posted a comment saying, um, you know, if you have a complaint, well, which one of the skeptical science arguments uh, are incorrect? <laughs> and, and no one could respond to him. So. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> All right, John. Well, look, that's really kind. Thanks for, for showing up again. Um, I'd just like to wish you uh, an extremely uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and we'll look forward. We haven't set a date for the show in the new year, but we'll get around to doing that soon. Um, and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, uh, looking forward to next year and hopefully for Christmas all I really want is an Ashes win. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. It's, um, Australia have been um, put into bat by England, so we'll see what's going to happen there. All right, I better uh, get on the, turn on the TV and have a look. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, Thanks John. John. See, see you. Soon.
See ya. Okay, Glenn, why don't we move on to the uh, final part of the show, which is our look at solutions and things that people can do to help to adapt to climate change. And th there's one item that I know you're very interested in because it involves alcohol. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, a, a piece I came across a couple of days ago about... Uh, what French winemakers and and uh, are doing to try and cope to the climate that's changing, um, that they see changing in their vineyards. I've, we've got a small vineyard here at Limestone Hills, and you know one of the things about growing things like grapes is that y you follow the plants so closely because mm. the quality of the wine that you make at the end of the day is entirely determined by that combination of soil and climate that the French call terroir, yeah. which is, uh, the, the terroir means the, the kind of spirit of the place, if you like, or the, the unique combination of factors of any given place. And what's happening in France is that that terroir is beginning to change, and it's beginning to change quite, um, quite dramatically. So what they're doing in the south of France in particular is they're looking at old grape varieties that were around before everybody started planting Cabernet Sauvignon and... Um, the Chardonnay and all the sort of popular grape varieties um, and they're looking for old things like Ugni Blanc I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be pronounced differently to that, probably Ugni Blanc um, that are better able to cope with extremes of climate so they're looking at so for the south of France they're looking at grapes that have been grown in Greece and Portugal um, and looking at some Spanish grapes perhaps because what they need to do is to get vines where they're designed to ripen in a warm climate. If you have a cool climate grape in a warm climate, mm. it kind of gets out of balance. So you get lots of sugars which become alcohol, but you get a drop in acidity. And so you get vine, wines that can be out of balance in themselves because it's important for the finished product that you get a balance between all these different factors. So they're looking for, for grape varieties that, that um, would be able to um, um, cope with these changes in climate and, and, and the, the warmth that, that, that they're already experiencing. So, um, the, the funny thing is that the, the, the warming of the climate over the last 20 years in France has actually brought them um, some fantastic wines because they, uh, in areas that were marginal, that were, you know, they might make... Uh, great wine one year in ten suddenly they're making great wines every other year um, but it's beginning to go beyond that point now and the wines are beginning to get a bit cooked and so they're, they're, they're really interested in doing this I mean the, the, the amount of wine we make in New Zealand is a small drop in the ocean compared to the production of France, Italy, Spain and so on and so it's a really big issue in those areas anyway so it's an interesting item um, the, well, and before, um, before we before we leave it, I'm just trying to get my head around why they're going back to varieties that were unsuccessful in the past. Well, it's not that they were unsuccessful; they were traditional in different regions. Um, and so, the, the th this would suggest, for instance, if you had a local grape variety that that worked in a warm place. Um, if you were to take that and put it into a colder place that's becoming warmer, it will stay in balance and give you the quality of the wine. Okay. Whereas what was happening, uh, what was happening over the last twenty to thirty years was everybody wanted to plant Chardonnay or everybody wanted to plant Cabernet Sauvignon, and so you were losing that um, kind of relationship with 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 the climate. Now, if, I'll give you an example. Um, in my little vineyard, I've got. Pinot Noir. I've got some Pinot Noir, and that's really a cool climate grape because mm. it ripens very early. Um, if my climate becomes hotter, what do I do? Do I well, the Pinot will get out of balance. Mm. Maybe I should start changing that over to Syrah, which is a, a warmer climate grape. Mm. So that's the sort of thing that they're thinking of doing, and it's interesting that they're looking back at. Um, older varieties, varieties from the southern regions of, of Europe, and they're able to do this with um, kind of genetic testing and so on. So as I say, it's a really interesting article. Um, anyone who enjoys drinking wine um, needs to sort of inform themselves about the sorts of things that the industry is having to take seriously. Mm. Okay, all right, let's move on to um, transport. We've got two stories about um, transport to finish up the show with. Um, first of all, focusing on London. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Boris Johnson, who is a man uh, not unknown to controversy, the uh, Lord, the Mayor of London, he is um, uh, promised, or that that he will require that all new black taxi cabs, the famous London black taxi cabs, they've got to be electric by 2020. Wow. Um, yeah, I thought that was cool. I mean, if, I don't know if if you've been to London and if you've been on a um, and one of those traditional black cabs, they're normally very noisy um, diesel engines, which are very sort of cheap to run and everything else, but they rattle and, th and they smoke. And so this is a, a, a bid to improve air quality as much as it is to reduce fossil fuel consumption. London's had um, a lot of problems with uh, what they call particulate pollution from diesel vehicles particularly. And so they're trying to clean up their act and they want to have this started by the time the um, by the Olympics are underway. It can't be the so, most efficient thing, though, um, kitting out these particular vehicles with uh, with electric motors, though, can it? Because aren't they very heavy, you know, they're very, very sturdy, um, old-style vehicles? Well, they are, but um, they've actually, the modern designs, the modern black clabs are not as bad as the old ones used to be in terms of weight and everything else. Um, they also tend to be used for relatively short journeys, um, they can be charged up um, overnight quite easily. Um, they've also announced in London that they're going to put 4,000 new electric vehicle charging stations around the city. Um, so you know, it's one way. It's one way to sort of stimulate the um, stimulate the business. And I, I guess it's quite crucial. Um, I think I misunderstood the story that it's actually new black cabs, so they won't be retrofitting. Oh no, they won't retrofit. No, no, mm. this is entirely for new new cabs. So that when your cab finally gives up the ghost and it's done two hundred thousand miles or something, and uh, the idea is that you replace it with a new one yeah. um, that's electric. Okay. And I think that's great. Be good to see. Um, um, not that I want one, mind you. No, but but maybe the the royal vehicles, perhaps leading in this area. Um, of course, the recent story with Prince Charles and Camilla going through the riots. It'd be nice to see them going through the riots in an electric vehicle in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Electrid armoured Pope mobile. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. And we're talking about um, mobiles, big mobiles, um, buses as well. GE's dual battery hybrid electric buses um, are, are uh, making some waves in this area as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is not the first hybrid bus in the world. Um, I think there's a New Zealand bus maker who um, uh, uses a hybrid power system. But what's interesting about this is that instead of having one large battery, it has a combination of two batteries, um, which means that it can be uh, more efficient. So it has a, a lithium battery and a sodium battery. The lithium battery can provide you with the bursts of power that you need to um, accelerate, for instance, uh, whereas the sodium battery can store large quantities of energy but isn't so good at delivering that, those power bursts. So when you put the two together, you can get um, sort of the right trade-off between storage and power availability. And the uh, G GE have built this um, bus as part of their zero emission uh, hybrid bus research project. Mm. Um, and it's the sort of thing that, that um, people are doing. They're beginning to mix and match different kinds of batteries. I think it's an Australian company that makes lead acid batteries that have um, what they call ultra capacitors associated with them. And the ultra capacitor is, is basically a device that can store um, uh, electricity and deliver it in uh, short, sharp shocks. Uh, whereas the lead acid battery is, is if you like, the, the, the big reservoir. So you put the two things together and you begin to get that right combination between um, the power storage and power availability. And of course... Um, uh, just, well, sorry, I, I, I just thought it was an interesting thing to, um, yeah. to look at. Well, and also, of course, having charging stations is an issue, but this particular bus has a 100-mile range, so it could pretty much, for the average, you know, probably do the average day's work, maybe on 100 miles. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, of course, about buses is that they, they tend not to do long trips per se. And so if you've got a, a battery that could be fast charged, for instance, it could be topped up during the day as well. Mm. Well, that's really, really nice. Um, that basically wraps up uh, this edition of The Climate Show, episode number four. Uh, yeah, this, this is our Christmas reindeer issue. Oh, it is, yeah. I don't see... We're not, uh, 
shame on me. There's a, I know there's a Christmas tree out there in the Kiwi office. Maybe I should have dragged it in here to <laughs> a little bit Christmas. Yeah, I should have put my red nosed reindeer hat yeah. on or something. Um, so anyway, we've we've it's our Christmas show. Um, I'm just trying to find my Christmas beagle here to wave <laughs> hello to everybody. Come here, little dog. Come here. <laughs> so it's a, it's a Merry Christmas from me, and it's a Merry Christmas from Rosie, the Beagle. And uh, she's been very good today. She hasn't woofed at all during the show. So. No, done very well. It's only the phone that's woofed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. And- um, so we'll be doing a show um, fairly early in January, I think um, second week in January, something like that. Um, I'm looking forward to having a couple of weeks with family and food. Yes, likewise. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, don't forget um, to subscribe to the show. You can find the links for all that up at hot-topic.co.nz. Um, you can also view it in, in YouTube if you are um, listening to the audio. There's also the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the climate show. Also on Twitter as well, twitter.com forward slash the climate show. Also want to thank um, the Bads uh, for providing the theme tune which is called Drop in the Ocean. It's on one of their latest um, CDs, and uh, I thought it fitted the show quite perfectly. So um, make sure you go and check out more Bad's music as well. Just search for them on YouTube or also uh, on Google as well. Absolutely. I find myself humming that tune to myself. It's cool, it's, isn't uh, it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good song. Good I really song. like it. So Well done, lads. A Merry Christmas to everyone and you and yours. And, um, yeah, we'll Merry see- Christmas. Nadolik flowen and bluy the nebida. That's Welsh for Happy Christmas and Happy New Year. Wonderful. We'll see you in the new year. Later. Cheers, Glenn. What good is a drop in the ocean? What good is a drop in the ocean?